Hello everyone, welcome back. So today's problem is from the chapter electrostatics. So this is CYU 22 from the book Pathfinder. Even though this question is in the electro chapter, this is mainly mainly a question from SHM, you could say. So anyway, so let's read the problem. So we have a dumbbell-like structure that is made by affixing two particles A and B at the ends of a light spring. Okay, both the particles have equal mass and the particle B carries a positive charge of Q. So the particle on the right has a positive charge of Q. A uniform electric field of intensity E pointing in the negative X direction is established in the region X positive. So this is where the origin is and towards the right of this region, uh, there is a there is an electric field which is constant in magnitude and its direction is towards the left. Okay. The dumbbell is initially at rest on the X axis in the region X negative. It is projected with a velocity U in the positive X direction as shown in the figure. After a while, the dumbbell is observed moving in the negative X direction with the same speed U. Okay, so basically what they're saying is uh, initially the dumbbell was projected with U towards the right and after the motion in the field is done, the dumbbell was observed to move towards the left with the same speed of U. Okay, so during this interval, particle A never enters the region of the field so the particle on the left it never crosses the barrier okay and it's given that the spring length becomes minimum only once okay so okay so the questions are we have to find the time the particle b spends in the electric field and if the process takes place exactly the same way as described, what should the relaxed length L of the spring be? Okay, so we have to find the time of motion in the field and the relaxed and the natural length of the spring. Okay, so pause the video guys and give this problem a try and then check out the solution, okay? All right, so this is how the motion looks like initially. Okay, and this is particle A and this is particle B, okay? Now, the moment particle B enters the electric field, electric force of magnitude Q multiplied by E acts on the ball B, okay? And Q is obviously a constant force. So if we take the particle A and B together as our system, the net external, the only net external force acting on the system is the force of, is the electrostatic force and it's in the minus I cap direction. Um, okay, so if we take both of them as a system, spring force is going to be internal, right? So the total time taken will be quite easy to figure out. All we have to do is uh, draw the initial and final situation. So initially both the balls were moving towards the right with a speed of U. And finally both of them, and after the motion in the field, they both move towards the left with the speed of U. So now as we know the velocities in the final situation and the initial situation, we can apply the impulse and momentum theorem, okay? So the impulse of all the external forces acting on the system. So here it'll be just minus QE, right? So it'll be minus QE times delta T, where delta T is the time interval between the initial and final situation. And that is what we have to solve for, right? So QE is a constant force. So we can just write it as QE multiplied by delta T, okay? This in the I cap direction. So this will be the, so this is going to be the impulse. So this would be the change in linear momentum of the system. So final linear momentum is minus 2 mui and minus the initial linear momentum is 2 mu in the i direction. So from here, delta t just turns out to be 4 mu divided by qe. Okay, so this is the answer to the first question. So now for the second question, it's not that easy. Okay, so now, so now let's discuss the second problem. So firstly, okay, so as we discussed in the previous part, the net external force acting on the system uh, is just the electrostatic force of qe. Right. So we can also say the acceleration of the center of mass of A and B, QE divided by the total mass, which is 2M, and it is in the left direction, right? So we know the acceleration of the center of mass. So the simplifying factor in this question is that the center of mass is moving with constant acceleration. So let's say this is the center of mass at some instant of time. While the ball B is in the electric field, it moves, okay, it is performing straight line, straight line motion with uniform acceleration, okay? So basically we can apply all the kinematics formulas for the center of mass. So as we can easily comment on that, on how the center of mass is moving, it is useful to choose the center of mass as our frame of reference in this question. Now guys, as the acceleration of the center of mass is QE by 2M towards the left, if we are observing with respect to the center of mass, uh, we'll have to apply a pseudo force, right? Because our center of mass is a non-inertial point. It's a non-inertial slash uh, accelerated point. So we have to apply pseudo force on each of our masses, right? As ACM is towards the left, I have to apply a pseudo force of minus MA on both of these masses. So on this mass, there will be a pseudo force of QE by two. And on this, we'll have a force of uh, QE by two towards the left. Okay, so, so basically what I did is I know the total external force is QE and to that I applied the pseudo force QE by 2 
and the resultant is QE by two towards the left. Okay, so I just directly wrote it over here. So this is my force diagram in the center of mass frame. Okay, so this is with respect to the center of mass frame. So now it's pretty uh, easy to understand how this is going to move. So, so now as we are in the center of mass frame, the center of mass is going to be a fixed point and this mass is going to perform an oscillatory motion. Similarly, even this mass is going to perform an oscillatory motion and the oscillations are going to be symmetric about the center of mass, right? It'll look like, it'll look like a mirror image of each other. Okay, so now once we know this is going to be an SHM, let's try to find out the time period and uh, amplitude of the oscillatory motion, right? So let's discuss more about the simple harmonic motion here. So the center of line is actually a fixed origin now. So we can mark it something like this. Okay, so and let's say this is the initial location. Okay, so I'm going to mark it with I. Okay, so now uh, keep in mind guys, this is not the equilibrium position of the SHM, right? Because the equilibrium position is the position where the net force on the mass or the net acceleration is actually zero, right? So that will happen sometime later. Let's say it is somewhere over here. So this is my equilibrium position. Okay, so and let's say and the distance between the extreme and the equilibrium position is what we call as the amplitude, right? And sim by symmetry, we can also say the particle on the right will have an equilibrium position somewhere over here. Okay, and when the particle reaches the equilibrium position, uh, the net acceleration will be zero. So we can balance the forces, right? So basically, when both particles reach the equilibrium position, what is the total compression in the spring? So that is going to be A plus A, which is 2A, right? So if this is one of my particles, the spring will apply a force of 2A multiplied by K. Okay, spring constant times the compression. And this should balance out my QE by 2, which is the external force. So this is going to be the equilibrium point. Okay, so from here, what we get is 2KA equals QE by 2. Okay, so now this is going to be the second extreme. So now the, the particle on the right is going to perform SHM about this equilibrium point and the amplitude of SHM is going to be A. And uh, similarly, the particle on the left is going to perform SHM about this equilibrium position. So now let's write down a few important notes here. So at time t equal to zero, uh, it's quite clear that the particles were at the extreme positions, which I which is this I, I point, right? Okay, and after uh, and after this instant, they will start moving towards each other. So basically we know that uh, as we saw earlier, there is a QE by two force trying to accelerate them in this direction. So they will compress the spring and then there will come a point of minimum compression at which the both the masses come to rest in the center of mass frame. And after this point, they will start moving in the opposite direction. Right. So this is how the motion is going to look like. So now the thing is, guys, uh, earlier we discussed that when both the particles get out of the field, the spring, uh, the dumbbell has a speed of u towards the left. What that means is the spring is in its natural length when it gets out. If the spring was not in its natural length, then it will actually oscillate. Right. But as we know that once the dumbbell gets out of the field, there is no oscillations. What that implies is that the spring is in its natural length when it gets out. Uh, and the third important realization is once the ball B is out of the field, spring will be in its natural length. And it was also given in the question that it only attains minimum length once, right? So now the question is for after t equal to zero, when will the spring be in natural length again? Okay. So at this instant, at, in this current diagram, it is in its natural length. So initially the spring is in its natural length, right? So now it's going to perform oscillation. So this is the equilibrium position. It is going to reach the other extreme and then come back. Now, when will the spring be in its natural length after this point? So let's say this is the other extreme. So this ball will go to the other extreme and come back, right? So what is this? This is after one oscillation, right? Extreme to mean, mean to extreme and and extreme to mean, mean to extreme. So this, kind of, so this comprises of one oscillation. So basically after one oscillation of the masses, the spring will attain its natural length once again, okay? So in the ground frame, if this is the field, the dumbbell enters the field and after returning, the spring is in its natural length. And that time we figured out it was 4 mu divided by QE, right? Okay, and uh, and from the COM frame, we figured out that the spring is once again in its natural length, it must have completed one oscillation, uh, one oscillation, about its equilibrium position, right? So basically the time period of this SHM should be the same as this particular time over here, right? So the time period of SHM of this, uh, for this two mass one spring problem is actually two pi square root of mu by k, 
where mu is a reduced mass, right? I mean, even if you guys don't know this formula, uh, you can consider the center of mass as the origin. It is fixed, right? And on the right, and just consider this half spring on the right. As And as we are considering the half spring, its spring constant will be 2k. And just consider one mass, okay? Because the time period of oscillation for one mass will be the time period of oscillation of the system, right? And the time and the time period for this case, we can easily write it as 2 pi square root of m by 2k. And in this case, mu itself is m by 2. So yeah, this is the time period of SHM of the masses. This should basically be equal to the this time that we figured out earlier, which is 4 mu by qe. Okay, so once again, in short, what uh, the spring was in its natural length before going in and after coming back also it was in its natural length. Then we looked at the oscillation diagram and we tried to figure out when will the spring be in its natural length once again. So we figured out that this mass will go to the other extreme and then it will come back and it will take a time of t which is 2 pi square root of mu by k to do that. So 2 pi square root of mu by k should be equal to the time the time which we figured out earlier okay okay so basically equating these two terms we'll get the spring constant uh, in terms of the known variables okay so yeah once we have the spring constant we can also find out the amplitude from over here now in the now guys the question wanted us to find out the uh, find out what is the relaxed length required okay okay so now what is the main constraint in this problem so so if this is the line that separates our field from the non-field region so i'm gonna get rid of the spring for a second right so basically my main idea is that throughout the motion the left mass shouldn't cross the field region right if the length of the spring was actually very large then the thing is there won't be any problem right this guy will enter and after delta t time it will get out and the second mass will be way behind the line right but so in the minimum case we can kind of get a feel that the mass on the left should just reach the field region and come to rest so in the case where we are talking about the minimum spring length the mass on the left should just come to rest as it reaches the vertical line because at this point if it had some velocity it will move into the region right okay so if you observe here though this was the initial position of mass one right and this is the final position so from here we can see that the displacement of the mass on the left is equal to the spring's natural length right so mathematically if you are trying to uh, explain this the max displacement of ball a should be less than l naught and this is in the ground frame so if it is greater than l naught then the ball a will go into the region of the field right okay so now how do we write down the max displacement of a so displacement of a we can write it as the displacement of a with respect to the center of mass plus the displacement of the center of mass right we can basically write this about any point but as we know that the center of mass is a nice point in this question we can take the help of the center of mass right okay so we didn't talk about the center of mass yet so the center of mass was initially at a distance of l naught by 2 towards the left right it was somewhere over here uh, between the balls right so it will follow a straight line trajectory right it will move in a straight line and then it will come back to its original position and this time period delta t we figured out earlier it was 4 mu divided by qe right okay so we can also write the v equal to u plus at expression for the center of mass so v equals the initial velocity of the center of mass was u uh, because both the masses had a speed of u initially so com also should move with the speed of u and minus the acceleration is qe by 2m into t right so if you take qe by 2m uh, common from this expression this term becomes 2mu by qe and minus t so from here what we can see is at time t equal to 2mu by qe which is half this time it comes to rest so it comes to rest at some point over here and after another time of 2mu by qe it reaches the original position right so this is how the displacements of the center of mass will look like so we are kind of getting a feel for what is the displacement of the center of mass it will move it will keep moving towards the right till this time and after this time, it will start moving towards the left, okay? And after 4 mu by QE, it reaches the original position. Okay, so now we have to analyze the displacement of A with respect to the center of mass. Now guys, keep in mind the original goal. The original goal was to figure out the maximum displacement of A in the ground frame. So now let's analyze this thing over here, the displacement of A in the COM frame. So for that, we'll bring back this diagram once again, okay? 
guys remember this thing uh, the 4 mu by qe that is also the time period of shm right so ti the time period of shm is also 4 mu by qe so now we're talking about this first expression sa with respect to com so the discussion is for sa with respect to com okay so this is the block a so this is block a so initially it will move towards the right okay it will keep moving towards the right and once it reaches the extreme position uh, it will come to rest right and when will it reach the extreme position that will take a time period of t by 2 right of the shm which is actually 2 mu by qe so let's draw the demarcation here when the mass reaches this point the to total time taken was total time taken will be t by 2 okay and after this point it will start moving towards the left okay so and that will take and after another t by 2 time it will reach back the origin so so guys here if you observe for a time of t by 2 what happens in t by 2 time the block the ball a moves towards the right right reaches the other extreme position and uh, in a time of t by 2 this what happens to the center of mass it moves towards the right and it comes to the rest at this point okay now till the time of capital t by 2 if you observe both the center of mass and the particle a are moving towards the right and after t by 2 the particle will start moving towards the left and the center of mass will move towards the left right so clearly the max displacement of particle a is at time t equal to capital t by 2 so because ultimately we have to add these two terms right so and if both of them are towards the right they'll get added up right because after t equal to t by 2 both the com will move towards the left and the in the oscillation diagram the particle will move towards the left so they are both starting to move towards the left so s a the maximum displacement of a will be the maximum value of s a with respect to com so, so now with respect to the center of mass frame what is the displacement of mass a so it moved a distance of 2 a in the rightward direction right it moved a distance of 2 a towards the rightward direction because if you guys observe the mean position was somewhere over here this is a and this is also a so it moved a distance of 2 a in the right to the right so this will be 2 a uh, i cap and the displacement of the center of mass uh, is going to be this particular value right so half the time period in t by 2 time the center of mass moved moved by this distance okay so for that we can use uh, the s equal to ut plus half at squared formula because the center of mass is moving in a straight line with uniform acceleration right so for s c o m we can say it is equal to u times the time so the time is 2 m u by q e minus half q e by 2 m which is the acceleration times the time squared okay so let's solve this so this becomes m u square divided by q e so this is 2 m u square by q e and this will be 2 2 cancels out with this uh, m u square by 2 e so final answer is going to be m u square by 2 e so the center of mass moves towards the right by a distance of m u square by 2 q e in the i cap direction okay so now we have to just substitute the value of a here and a we already figured out it was equal to qe by 4k okay so now let's just substitute everything back into this equation so we'll get the maximum displacement of a this particular value okay so this discussion was clearly a bit complicated so i'd recommend you guys watch it again or if you have any doubts you can ask below okay so basically yeah our original logic was that the max displacement of sa should be less than my natural length right so l naught this natural length so this should be greater than the maximum displacement so which is mu square by qe 1 plus 2 by pi whole squared so this will be the solution for the smallest value of natural length which will allow this motion okay if l naught is less than this particular value then the particle a will jump into the field okay okay guys so that was it for this video if you guys uh, enjoy the video make sure to like share and subscribe and that's it thanks for watching